Okay, I think we're live and we're gonna go now. So good afternoon everyone and welcome to this webinar on borders hosted by the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. My name is Sofie Berglund and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to a webinar that I have been looking forward to for a very long time, since March to be exact, when this webinar was intended to be held in front of a live audience. As we all know, the pandemic has shifted our ways of working, but I am very happy to be able to meet with all of you to discuss borders online instead. And as we will learn today, a lot has happened in regard to international border politics since March. So although it was postponed, I think this webinar is a very timely one. And before I introduce you to our two very distinguished speakers, I would like to encourage you to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag UI event. And post your questions here in the Q&A, and if you want to ask your question anonymously, check the little um, box in the Q&A field before sending your question. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speakers who will guide us through the very broad but timely topic of borders and trends in global bordering policies. First, we have Dr. Johanna Pettersson, who is a researcher at Uppsala University and associated researcher here at UI. This spring, she published the UI paper, Higher Fences and Wider Nets, Global Trends in Bordering Policies, which she will introduce in more detail in a minute. But Johanna, when I first called you up for a short interview in March to talk about the then current trends in bordering politics, you mentioned that when you started your PhD, you were somewhat questioned about your choice of research field. Would you like to just briefly share with us why? Yeah, uh, I think uh, at that time, that was about 10 years ago, um, the idea of borders um, perhaps generally had been that they were becoming more open and uh, I think especially in political science that we didn't need to give much attention to borders in themselves but rather like take them a bit more for granted but I mean to be honest maybe it was also that I wasn't making my argument well enough but today however considering what's happened I think it's uh, much easier to make the argument that we really need to study borders uh, in themselves and the politics surrounding them. Yeah, for sure. A lot has happened since then. Uh, and you will get more into that in a minute. But uh, our second speaker is Dr. Matthew Longo, currently assistant professor at Leiden University, who received his PhD from Yale University. And Matthew, your research focuses on borders, sovereignty and security. And I'm sure we'll touch upon all of these subjects in the hour and a half ahead. But is there anything in particular you look forward to digging into today? Yeah, so I'll speak quite a bit about COVID because I think that obviously the work that I've done in my book project and my, in my uh, work as an academic is pertinent, but COVID is, has in some ways changed the game, in some ways has kept it the same. And so I'll focus on that. I look forward to that. And if you in the audience like this webinar, his book, The Politics of Borders, Sovereignty, Security and the Citizen After 9-11, published with Cambridge University Press, is available in stores now. And uh, I think we're all eager to get started, so I will leave you two to dive into the subject, and I will be back just shortly before we end for a quick wrap-up. And for you in the audience, remember that Johanna will pick up your questions throughout the webinar, uh, so don't wait until the last minute to post them. And Johanna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophie. So um, in the paper that I wrote this spring, as Sophie mentioned, uh, I discussed some of the current developments uh, in the policies towards borders around the world. And um, I'll just now give you a very brief um, introduction to some of the arguments that I made in this paper. So. One of the main points, and also the title of the paper, uh, is where I describe a borders today as becoming harder and wider. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but first, just to sort of lay a basis for the discussion that we will have today, I just wanted to say some things about sort of what is the point of borders. So national borders as we know them today are really, I think, at the core of the existence of sovereign states. So by marking the edge of the state, borders create the territory over which a state has jurisdiction. And in this way, it makes it possible 
to separate one state from another. And one of the main uh, benefits or points of this um, is that a clearly, clearly bounded territorial unit um, is something that can be used as a base for legitimacy. So political rule within a territory can be ordered, for example, by establishing who belongs, thereby making voting and democracy sort of possible within a bounded unit and establishing clear chains of accountability between the population and its leaders. Uh, furthermore, I think since the end of the Cold War and the creation of the United Nations, um, it, the international system that we have is um, has to depend heavily on uh, sovereign states as the base for international cooperation. So a lot of the international relations that we have are dependent on these. So that's sort of a basic idea of the, the point of borders in today's world. Well, um, after I think the end of the Cold War, there came a period of globalization and talk of a borderless world. Uh, and this is the, the thing that Sophie mentioned earlier, why we didn't maybe think about borders as something being very uh, a thing of today, but rather a thing of the past. Today, however, we are seeing a lot of devel developments towards both harder and wider borders. And what do I mean by that then? Well, harder borders, uh, we can think of both in terms of symbolically becoming harder. Uh, states are putting up more restrictions on immigration, making visa access harder and so on. But I was more thinking about the actual physicality of border markers. So current research show that borders today are, or more border walls and fences are being built today than any time previously in our sort of modern history. Um, and it's not only through walls and fences, but actually research has also shown that states are trying hard to make their territorial borders visible through uh, border control buildings, security checkpoints, and so on. Um, so this is how borders are becoming harder, like materially uh, manifest in the uh, place where they are. But borders are also becoming wider, meaning that border controls today have stretched both outwards and inwards. So outwards, borders are moving away from borders of states controlling them. So for example, the EU and the US both have agreements with their neighbors so that their neighbors will have border controls uh, to prevent uh, potential migrants from even reaching the borders of the EU or the US. So this is one way in which borders are extending outwards. Another way is that borders are extending inward. For example, that within Schengen you can have passport controls anywhere within the Schengen territory. So it's like a continuous border within territory. So what is then the problem with borders coming, becoming harder and wider? Um, the most obvious, and I think the problem that has been most uh, discussed and given most attention, because it's the most urgent one, is of course that borders are violent and that people are dying trying to cross borders. Um, so this is something that is a direct result of restrictions to migration and the physicalities of border walls, for example. But I think we also need to give attention to some other developments that are taking place that are sort of maybe secondary to these immediate effects of harder and wider borders. And the first one is that harder borders, such as fences, don't only stop humans, but also animals from crossing. So they often have very um, extensive effects on the sort of natural environment where they are. And I think this is um, something that is not being given attention at all in the sense that they are contributing to sort of destruction of ecosystems and so on. And the second thing with wider borders, and I think 
Matthew, you uh, talk about this, I think, really well in, in your book, is that the widening of the borders inwards also has effects on uh, the population, sort of the citizens within the border. So especially um, extending border controls inwards can cause states to subject their own citizens to border controls, which particularly targets for example, racialized minorities and people living in near proximity to borders. And I think being controlled and having one's right to belong questioned in this way is really something that most people would not feel comfortable with. So in total then, I think all of these developments can raise the question if policies towards borders are not causing more insecurity than they are protecting from. So what might happen is that the policies that we see today with harder and wider borders might actually be undermining the legitimacy of the states rather than uh, being part of constructing this legitimacy of the state. So that's where I think the sort of paradox of border lies that we might be able to discuss a bit more. But I think with that, I'll give over to you, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've just unmuted. Yeah, that's great. So since we began with Johanna's uh, origin story, I want to offer an origin story of my own, which is that I also faced a uh, initial uh, roadblock when I tried to write about or think about borders. Um, it was it was two thousand eight, and it wasn't really a subject uh, in political science, but frankly, in in the academic realm of the social sciences, there weren't many books. And part of the reason for that is, uh, as I, if I was to try to think sociologically about what world we're coming into and thinking about borders this way, it's that there seemed to be a, a cardinal error that a lot of people who are thinking about borders were making in the 2000s, let's say, which is twofold. One of them is the one that Johanna mentioned, which is that because we're coming out of globalization, I think it took a while for us to realize exactly what was happening in the sense that all structural transformations in politics take time. And it really was the, so to use the, the language of political science, um, you can say the 90s represented de-bordering or the getting rid of borders, the borderlessness. And the 2000s represented re-bordering, the building of walls. But even that took quite a bit of time. So it took some, just a general thing. It took time for people to realize what was happening. Uh, but the other part of it, is that for most of us, borders are lines on the map. They're quite literally, uh, I mean, to use the language that Johanna used, they're, they're, they're jurisdictional lines or they're state lines. But we think of states though we see maps, which is to say that they're more or less, you know, country A is orange and country B is green, like on a map, and there's a black line between them separating them. And a border in that rubric can't be more complicated. It's just a line saying there's, a, there's sovereignty on one side and sovereignty on another side and the line divides them. And it required a change in thinking about what a border is outside of that legal conception, right? This idea that it's just a jurisdiction into this political conception that it's an institution. Because once it's an institution, then you have politics located at the border. Then you can ask questions about, well, how hard is the border? How wide is the border to use the language Johanna just used? But also there are people, what kinds of officers, what kinds of offices, what kinds of politics undergird the policies and policy making at that border. And once you start to ask those kinds of questions, then lots of different ways in which the politics open up. And I think that what we're talking about now is that kind of new understanding of borders as sites of politics. And I uh, to speak for a second about my own research, also, also kind of riffing off a little bit of what Johanna said, uh, there's a couple themes that then come out of looking at borders this way. So one of them has to do with sovereignty. Sovereignty in a very uh, simplistic sense is as represented in the, in the cartographic way of there's just country A and country B. Uh, but in fact, the closer you look at a border and spend time at a border, so for me, my own research was in the US-Mexico border, you know, most of us in the different uh, border studies realm have a different border of, of expertise that happens to be mine. And in the US-Mexico borderlands, what you see when you, when you go and spend time and interview officers and 
um, really start to, to, to piece together what the institution is, is that uh, countries, in this case, US and Mexico, but also US and Canada, the two US borderlands that I know well, uh, work together. But okay, if they're working together and they're bordering, if they're doing what's called, or now could be, could be thought of as what's called co-bordering, right? It's not uh, de-bordering or re-bordering. It's something actually new entirely. It's states saying we're gonna work together, which is part of what we can call widening. It's this idea that a border is ultimately a dual managed zone because states are protecting their interests together. So uh, in addition to changing what we mean by sovereignty, it also changed what we mean by security in the sense that now you're looking at a complicated picture where states think they're making their citizens more secure, even though that's something Johanna troubled as, as, and it's good that she did, but certainly the state thinks it's making uh, the students is more secure. We might argue they're not. But conceptually, what's so interesting is that so often we think of sovereignty and security as the same, right? We think of that the, that the sovereign state protects itself. It makes itself more secure. And in fact, what we're seeing is that in the name of security, states are ceding certain aspects of sovereignty. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the conceptual difference or the thing that's occurring at borders. Um, so I won't, I won't hearken about that research too much because I want to talk about Corona, but the general points being that so suddenly all this conceptual work opens up. Uh, the, the thing I want to talk about today is slightly different, although it's related, which is the question of one of the big changes or the one of the big trends in bordering, uh, which Johanna alluded to a little bit at the end of her talk, is this idea that you know, borders are everywhere, which is not the most helpful way of seeing things. But what can be said is that borders are becoming more digital which is part of what everywhere means, that there's a data construct of borders. And what that means is that states are getting better and better at using data to filter populations at their borders, right? To keep out what they don't want, migrants or even unwanted citizens, right? Uh, and let in more quickly what they do want. And uh, the problem as I see it, when I think about going forward vis-a-vis -vis Corona, is that whereas there are legitimate ways in which data might be used to protect states and citizens, uh, so for example, if there's a, you know, a potential terrorist or person on a terrorist watch list, you can understand how a state would wanna use data to protect against a terrorist coming into their country. There are lots of reasons on a civil rights basis that might not be legitimate, et cetera. But principally we understand how uh, a state might see that is in their interests. And there are lots of ways in which we use data to filter people, in particular based on risk. And the problem in the book as I talk about risk is that what happens is, is states are using risk to replace citizenship. So the, the most basic example in the American context is that an Arab American is more likely to get stopped at an American airport then, for example, Johanna. Why? Johanna is a citizen of a different country, and yet Arabness is a marker of risk in America. And so even though you're a citizen, even though you're an American, that risk marker ends up replacing citizenship as the basis of filtering, as the basis of determining who enters. And so how does this relate to Corona? My fear is that we will start to use Corona safety measures this presumption of health, the idea that some people have taken tests as a way to filter people at our borders. What I mean by that is that imagine you're a country, country A looks like Sweden, it's wealthy, it's predominantly white, it's predominantly safe in the broad sense, it's considered democratic and liberal, etc. And it might be that we have no problem as the American state or any state taking in people from Sweden and we have another state, imagine this state is uh, less white, less affluent, less Christian, right? Less liberal, less democratic. We anyways might wanna restrict those people from coming into our country. So what we'll start to do is to use Corona and the safety measures of health tests as a way of saying those people can't come in from country B because we don't trust their health test. When in fact what we're doing is excluding them because they come from country B. Meaning we're finding another way to justify keeping out someone who might be Muslim or come from a poor country, et cetera. 
So suddenly we trust Sweden's health test and we don't trust this other unnamed imaginary country's health test. When in fact, all we're really doing is perpetuating the divide we anyway see at borders where states use data for preferential treatment and discrimination against peoples they don't want to let in. So that's the short version of my Corona fear. I won't speak more before blowing past my time limit, but we can maybe talk more about this in Q&A. Yes, so interesting. Now we have got, gotten into, I think, uh, what is on everyone's minds, really, what will happen with the, the COVID uh, or coronavirus uh, pandemic. I, um, I have to say that I very much agree with you, Matt, in terms of um, this fear that uh, restrictions that are being put in place um, in terms of trying to protect from um, uh, spread of the disease will uh, also be used uh, in other measures or for other uh, filtering other kinds of things. I think uh, I want to come back to a few things um, that you said now that that really play into this. And I think one of the first things that you said were, um, you know, as political scientists, I definitely I had the same experience that you had that, you know, borders, they're just there, they're, they are the sort of start. And then we have states and then we can compare states and discuss what states are doing. And it took a while to actually start looking at borders as institutions in themselves. And I think it's really good that you made this point that we that is what we have to do as political scientists if we want to um, understand how borders are being used to achieve different types of ends for the state or for states in cooperation. But I think um, connecting that to the COVID uh, issue, I think one really interesting thing is when we start to look at borders as institutions and also analyze them uh, in the way that we do other types of institutions. When we think about institutional change and what e external shocks to institutions and so on, because I think one thing, and I talked with Sophie actually about this in an interview she did with me this spring about what some of the prospects for the COVID um, reactions were when we think about borders. And one thing I said then, and I think that plays into what you said now, is this risk that, um, for example, if a state introduces border controls as a way to limit the spread of COVID, once you've done that kind of introduction of a new type of border control, uh, it might become sort of part of the normal meaning that my fear is, this is very much related to what you said, my fear is that it will be very hard to uh, remove that kind of introduced control once it's in place. Uh, and this is a development, I think, that's taking place uh, with borders in general, that they are sort of self-reinforcing. The more money you spend on controlling borders, the the more the control grows, so to speak. Uh, have you had um, similar um, experiences in your research as well? Yeah, so I think that that's, I mean, that's really interesting. I, what I would say is, I think there's a broad point in politics, which is that once you set up an institution of any sort, you create office holders and office holders have interests. And it'll always be in the interests of people that have any kind of power to keep that power. And so part of the trouble of reestablishing border checks is precisely that now there are people who uh, are winners of that exchange, that benefit. It might be uh, because there, there, are, there are particular office holders that, that have a new kind of power. That's the political story. It might also be a lobbying story, right? So for example, uh, let's say you, are, you benefit from protectionist policies. And for the 20 years of openness in Europe, for example, you might have actually lost out. Let's say you're a you know, small cheesemaker in a non-cheesemaking country. You'd actually benefit from having it harder to get cheese from the cheesemaking countries into your country, right? So protectionism generates interest holders. And you 
can imagine a hundred ways in which this might play out, but suddenly you've, you've created, to use the terrible phrase we think of uh, with Israeli settlements in the West Bank, but you've created, you know, quote unquote, facts on the ground. And once you create facts on the ground, it's incredibly hard to undo them. Uh, and that's also just because of political inertia, right? And so my question, because I think I see the general trend you're speaking to, to kick it back to you, would be to ask, because I know you've been interested in particular in the Europe question and the ways in which uh, there's been kind of an undoing of Schengen uh, or a, maybe not undoing, but a complicating of Schengen with uh, these checks. I was curious to see how you saw this would, would play out. Like if you had to map forward the European story of this problem. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think, uh, yeah, I just actually started a new research project on the internal borders of Schengen. Uh, and I started it uh, just as all the coronavirus uh, border controls were being implemented. And I think, um, yeah, as I said, um, it's a very different situation, for example, from the temporary border controls that were introduced as a result of the refugee crisis in 2015. I mean, the causes is different and also to some extent, which countries that are doing this uh, um, implementing of temporary controls is also a bit different. But I think to some extent they follow the same logic, which I think is this uh, thing that once they're in place, it might be harder to uh, do away with them than you think. So even though they are introduced as being temporary, uh, they might um, become rather um, a long-term solution. Um, I think um, one thing to, as you said, like the, is it the undoing or, of Schengen or how, to, how should we describe it? And I think the, this is a very discussed uh, issue at the moment, I think, in the, for people working on uh, Europe's borders. And, there are two sort of stories here. And one is that this uh, represents renationalization and sort of the Brexit being sort of the ultimate example of uh, member states losing faith in European cooperation and becoming more closed in on themselves and reestablishing borders. But there's also this other story, which is that, well, it's still happening within the Schengen rule framework uh, and um, European countries are still cooperating on introducing these kind of controls. So it might not be that it's the end of Schengen, but rather than it's a um, reconfiguration, if you will. And I think um, this also plays into something that I wanted to ask you and that you were also mentioning a bit, which, which is this, that borders aren't really I think it's a problem when we think about borders as being open or closed. So in globalization, they were open and they were opening and we could do away with them and now we're closing them. Because as you say, it's, it's a bit more uh, a filtering or a di differentiation in how open or closed they are. Uh, would you like to play into that? Have you thought about that? Yeah, thanks. Okay, there's now, now a lot on the table. So uh, on the subject of open and closeness, yeah, I completely agree. I think it was always a bad, um, it was the wrong set of, of, of terms to describe what borders are and what they do. And I think the better way of thinking of borders is either simply as having discrete institutions. So for example, uh, almost all borders have uh, ports, like places of entry, and they have perimeters. And doesn't matter how liberal or democratic or open your country is, the perimeter will always be a mechanism of shutting out. Whether it's fenced, whether it's just barbed wire, whether it's a wall, whatever it ends up being, uh, perimeters are designed to be places that people don't cross. And ports of entry, no matter how closed your country is, always let someone in. I mean, even North Korea is gonna have some kinds of port policies. And so open and closed, as well as their sort of metaphoric counterparts, which is the idea that there's um, a bridge or a wall, right? This, this, this kind of very 
uh, strong normative language that like the world would be better if borders were bridges between people and it's and it's normatively worse if there are walls between people uh, is all kind of made up because actually all borders have both bridge and wall like functions and ports are more bridge like even if they're quite restrictive and perimeters are always wall like even if they're not walls. And so we, this is sort of a general issue we have with terminology. All of it is about filtration. And once you accept that that's roughly what borders are doing, then you have to start to be able to ask uh, the more interesting question, which is not open or closed, but open and closed for whom? And my, my, my concern is almost always about using legitimate reasons uh, to, to exclude people and uh, use those legitimate reasons to cover up illegitimate ones, whatever particular way you're thinking of legitimacy per se. And uh, to give this back to the European example and the question of concrete borders, like physical borders in Europe, uh, I think you're right to say there's a big difference between the migration closures of 2015 and the present because the migration closures faced a ton of resistance actually and there was a lot of political will to uh, resist reclosing borders, et cetera. But the problem with COVID is that there's now this kind of perfect legitimate reason to close a border, like a virus. It's not political. It's not normatively weighty, so to speak. It isn't about excluding people who are based on the wrong religion or the wrong minority. There are many normative reasons we might have to say that shutting people out is unjust or unacceptable. And COVID is not that issue, right? COVID, almost everyone agrees. If you can stop or the flow of the virus, that's better. The problem is, is that it's also true on physical, but with physical borders, is that all the people that had the, the anti-migrant pro-border shutdown agenda in 2015 are going to use this current COVID crisis to legitimate the thing they couldn't get through in 2015 for the wrong reasons by pretending it's for the right reason. And so it all plays in, whether it's uh, digital or concrete. Um, but I do think it's important that there are different kinds of issues, the 2015 one and the present one. Um, and I think that, yeah, the more we make it seem as though all border closures are the same, uh, elides this problem that actually the question is never really closure or openness, uh, but rather for whom, by whom, and why. So relating to that, maybe we should take uh, a question from uh, our uh, audience here. We have one question that sort of, I think it's a very big question, but it also plays into many of the things that we've already talked about. And that's, uh, are borders really necessary in a world of globalized economy and digital interconnection? Or do they create more conflicts um, than what is sort of necessary, maybe you could say? What would you say to that? Are borders necessary? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of the, that, that's, that's the rub. There's a, there's a very strong case that borders, because they're violent, um, and because they are tools of exclusion, that the world would be better without them. And I tend to resist that conclusion because I think that whereas borders themselves are perhaps bad things, the alternative looks a lot more like uh, something where there's no states either, and actually something more like a world state. And I think that, that the more you centralize authority in larger uh, organs, the more ever powerful it is, what you end up creating is a new kind of violence, a new kind of power. You know, in politics, you very rarely get rid of violence and power and bad actors acting badly. And there's this way that we talk about borderlessness as this panacea. I don't think it is at all. I think all it does is it relocates where the issue is. And I actually think we're better off having much smaller units of power uh, than would, would, would be necessitated in a borderless world. So I think the problem is that you want borders to be not violent and not exclusionary, but you also want to keep something like small political units intact. And therefore, I'm less inclined to believe 
uh, that borderlessness is even the right question. I think the right question is how do we shape the institution of the border in a way that we consider to be more just and therefore delimit its violentness or its, uh, its less just forms of exclusion, et cetera. So I, that, that would be my take on the question. I, maybe Johanna has a very different take on this question, but it's a, it's a very divisive one in the people who care about the border, but also care about the political theory, care about questions about what a just world would look like, will always have a, 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 uh, a dispute on exactly this uh, like rupture line, let's say. So maybe you have a different perspective, Johanna. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I think you uh, summarized really well what, what is also very much my opinion. And I think um, the question, uh, this was a question from um, Evangelia. Uh, and I think, I mean, the question is, of course, something that everyone is thinking about, like, if they are so violent, if we are so uh, sort of keen on using borders to exclude what isn't desired from the state. I mean, how how necessary can they be? But I, I think you're definitely right. And I think one way to um, to sort of counter this question is also to think about, okay, but what's the alternative? Uh, is that, um, because if we look through history, we haven't had nation states and borders being these like uh, territorial delimitations of jurisdiction uh, and le legitimacy in the same way all the time. We've had empires. I mean, maybe that's an alternative, having much huger uh, political organization. Or is it to have, um, I mean, some argue that we see developments uh, uh, more similar to a feudal system where we have some rich enclaves sort of closing in on each other. And then we have uh, a, a sort of web of connections with other uh, smaller local um, areas and so on. And I, I think um, the alternatives that we can think of are not as easily made legitimate um, as the, the state's system that we have today is for, for better or worse. I mean, it's not an, it's not an optimal uh, way of doing things, of course, but I think you're right to ask the questions of how do we do borders rather than do we need them or should they be there? It's more productive for uh, at least, I think. Yeah, if I can jump in. So I, I, um, I guess I'd say one more thing on that, on that subject, which is that we now think of borders as, as, as death traps as these dangerous places with walls and uh, we have images of people in the desert dying in the u.s mexico borderlands or in the, the mediterranean drowning and they become a a visual image of violence and exclusion etc but you know the old way of thinking about borders not in our present age was actually the border was there to protect small states from bigger ones and this is the question of empire again, you know, without borders, the idea that large countries, large polities, powerful, rich polities wouldn't just keep expanding their power and trammeling the rights and needs of all the people in their peripheral areas. Uh, that's kind of the story of the West, certainly of Europe, up until the Treaty of Westphalia or whatever, I mean, how important that treaty was, I don't know, but um, that's a disputed thing in, in, our, in our business. But let's, let's just take that as a date for a moment in the 17th century. And until the 17th century, the, the problem of, of violence was imp imperial overtaking, it was war. And so borders became essentially tools to protect small states from big ones and create a space for the nation state against these very aggressive, greedy empires. And so now that we've sort of solved the problem of empire, now it seems like the border is the problem. But of course the fear is that you then get rid of the border and what do you do? You recreate the terms of the same issues of uh, imperial overextension, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we, we just, Things like erasing the borders on a map seem really, 
uh, dreamy. <laughs> like who wouldn't love to be able just to take a map and take an eraser and get rid of all these dis stupid distinctions. Um, but the more you read about borders in history, there's a little bit of a, of a caution, a cautionary tale you might say to doing that. Okay, so thank you. I think that was uh, very well put. Um, let's see, we have a question from Niklas who says, um, obviously border controls can become overzealous and undermine legitimacy uh, of their own le legitimacy, of course, and the legitimacy of the state, but are not increased border controls an effect of increased globalization? So this is so somewhat of a paradox. Um, do you want to start commenting on that and I can fill in? Sure, I think it's exactly right. I think that these are just, these are processes that are entangled, which is to say that, that again, to get back to politics being about interests, there's a lot of reason that globalization created winners and it created new flows and there's a tremendous good that came out of, out of um, globalization. And it's not surprising that uh, the, the, the counter move would come from states realizing that maybe this went too far or there's also a cost to globalization. And, you know, in the European context, we think of this more about migration, right? We have a, a Europe has had no problem with uh, money flowing across their borders uh, and they don't tend to like people flowing across their borders. So in the, in the 90s, when it was money, there was a lot of a boon time. There was a lot of a boon period. The moment migration started to kick in, this desire to be more protectionist followed. Uh, in the US, it was actually more about terrorism, equally uh, bad, right? It wasn't a great American response to say, well, we have this uh, racial or ethnic exclusion that we want to overreact to. We want to use 9-11 as a way to justify doing things also against migrants, but also to start to take in the flows we like and keep out the flows we don't. So it's all the same story. One way to think of it uh, is that, so the, the filtration story, the port story, which I think is what we're mostly talking about in this sense, uh, is that there was this period in the pre 9-11 period where certainly in the globalization period where there was more or less no checks at all. And what happened with 9-11, certainly the US, but also across Europe, and then with all the different terror attacks in Europe, um, in 05 and 07, et cetera. And so that's the first decade of the 2000s is there was this rush to increase checks and become more data centric and very careful about who's admitted and who's not admitted. And what happened then is that this rush for security ended up having a huge hit on the economy because what happens with the economy then is everything gets slowed down and businesses lose out. And so we had this problem where the 90s was great for the economy and bad for security. And then the 2000s was great for security and bad for the economy. So they had to find a way to square that circle. And the way they squared the circle is by having some version using data and filtration of more checks for some, meaning riskier people, products, goods, et cetera, and less checks for others, meaning you speed up things you trust and you slow down things you don't. That was a way to have security, but also let the economy keep going. But of course that created a very unequal kind of filtration, right? So the more, to go back to the example of the Johanna versus the Arab American, right? This, that story, the more your profile as a traveler looked like Johanna, the more likely you would travel freely and quickly because all the different risk metrics would be satisfied. And so that's how they're intertwined, right? So the globalization and the, and the rewalling or the securitization periods roughly went from this economic security cost deficit problem to this solution through data. Um, and that's kind of where we are at the present. Johanna, I feel like that, I don't know if that remotely would be how you would answer that question. Yeah, uh, I think it would be to, to a great extent, uh, but I think it also, to some extent, um, 
builds on the idea that we ever that we ever actually had complete free movement uh, for people because I think globalization in uh, in its um, like um, as you were saying I mean it it mostly had to do with the economy and the freedom of movement of capital of goods and those things are those things are still in place I mean that is not something that has um, uh, become more restricted there aren't uh, still walls for um, capital to move around as much as there there could be i mean if we if we thought of it as a counter movement to globalization so i think you're right that it's those these are more parallel developments um that are maybe resulting from uh one another so to speak i think two points uh that i could add here this is often a question that comes into uh, the question of uh, Europe and the Schengen Agreement or the EU um, that when we talk about the external borders of Europe we're often uh, discussing just these harsh uh, restrictions to migration and um, and and sometimes I feel like uh, maybe we uh, sort of um, forget or I don't know not take into account okay but what is um how did this happen and the opening of the borders within europe uh sort of required i mean part of the agreement to open borders uh, also is including that we need or that europe needed to close its external borders uh, and that um I mean, the, the alternative today would be that each country has its own uh, migration regime and its own border controls. So <clears throat> perhaps the sum there of border control would have still been the same. It's just that it's, it's moved and become more visible at the external borders. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's actually harsher than what each country had before uh, individually. Um, so that is one thing. And the other thing that you mentioned, and that I think is also very important to um, to connect to this question of globalization, uh, which has been argued by, among others, Rhys Jones, uh, is the how um, closed borders are sort of keeping global economic inequality intact. So that the way <clears throat> it's not only about race or like culture and uh, migrations from certain countries, but it's also about keeping uh, global production uh, costs low by restricting movement from low-income countries where capital can produce their goods that are then exported to richer countries and so on. Um, so I think that's also an issue that sort of connects globalization to border control. Yeah, and if I, I think that's a great answer. And if I can just say one thing off of what Johanna said, uh, the other part of it, and I think this is what she sort of began with, is that a lot of this is just our own mythology. We have this idea that prior to wall building and all these things, that there was something like free travel or that there wasn't all these kinds of heinous, violent forms of exclusion. None of that's true. Of course it was always there. And there's a way that we have this mythology of free movement in the West that we're quite obsessed with. And to perpetuate that mythology, we sort of don't look under certain rocks, right? We, we avoid certain subjects. And I'm sure if one looked very carefully at what free movement in the West really looked like in the 90s and even the 80s and the 70s, et cetera, I think we'd find lots of the same things at play. Often what happens in politics is just that those inequalities and those discriminatory practices solidify. And so what's happening with data is just the ever more perfect tool to do what we anyways were doing and wanted to do before. And it's allowing us to see something. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think that Johanna's right, that there's a, there's a general part of the problem with even creating these kinds of discussions or binaries of whether it's economy and security or globalization or debordering and rebordering and all these things, is that it elides how many of the same kind of problems uh, were there in the past.
Yes, thank you. Okay, so here we have a question for you, Matthew, from Vladimir. Uh, he asks, um, considering borders as institutions is very interesting. Um, I agree. I think that's like what we really need to do in order to study borders as political science scientists. Um, and, and with this comes, of course, I think, understanding borders as something man-made. I mean, they are not natural. I mean, they are historical artifacts to some extent, but they are also constantly being constructed, upheld, remade, reconfigured by political decisions and by the actions that people take uh, surrounding them. So I think that's very important to understand. So the question he had was, um, I guess we can assume that the borders are institutions of sovereignty, as we've been talking about, politics and governance. Uh, could we look into borders as institutions of democracy as well? What would you say to that? That's a great question. Um, so thank you for that. So I, I have a, so part of the discussion I have in my book is a, so whereas the first parts, let's say are empirical, it's about understanding what a border is and how it's evolving. Uh, and what it means to look at a border as an institution, right? Uh, but of course, what that does is it changes the language we use when we talk about borders, and in particular, it changes the kinds of questions we can ask. And whereas if a border is a thin jurisdictional line, the kinds of questions you can ask are about open and closed. That makes sense if it's just a line. It's all it can be is more or less open or closed. And so part of the point of thinking of it institutionally is then to ask whether or not this changes the kinds of, 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 of questions we might ask, right? Or, or, or normative issues at play. And one of the things I talk about in the book is that what, what thinking about borders and institutions allows us to do is to see the potential at least for borders to become uh, sites of democracy or democratic meaning making of some sort, whether it's through voting or through representation, et cetera. And I tend to think that now we think of them as necessarily spaces of democratic deficit, right? So for example, a local community, uh, it doesn't really have a say in what is built at the border. The border is made it, you know, so in the US case, some little town in Arizona pushed up against the border doesn't really have a say in what that border looks like. That's designed in Washington, which in the US case is thousands of miles away. And so that's, that is a classic case of, of a democratic deficit. Part of the argument I make in the book is that once we start to see these borders as these wider interlinking spaces, within that zone of a border, you can start to actually design democratic practices so that people have more of a say in the security infrastructure that will ultimately determine and affect their lives. And so that might be something like uh, joint councils or representative institutions that are at the border, situated in the border zones. It might also be different ways of thinking about how borderland citizens uh, might use their position um, or have a, a structural kind of a vote or way, way of influencing policy in, in, in the center. Um, but the, the broad answer, I mean, outside of, without getting into specifics, the broad answer is, I think that's exactly how we should see them. Uh, but at the present, we don't tend to. It's a great question. Well, what, what's, what's your uh, attitude towards that, Johanna? Um, thank you. Well, yeah, I agree. It's a good question. Um, and I think your interpretation of, like, of it, of the problem and the solution, um, there, there is a potential for some solutions there, I think. Um, and I agree. And I think one thing that I want to mention, or that you sort of, point to here is also this question of uh, like a core problem of how political science and international relations have been looking at borders, which is, you know, they're just there. They are the thin line that separates one state from another. It, this also means that we often think about borders as enclosing something that is unitary. Uh, and not seeing, like you say, that the interests of those the local population in this border town might be different from the interests of the central government. And I think those kind of center periphery questions, uh, the questions of like 
people are actually living near the border and for them borders are completely something else than just a line on the map they are you know uh, for many border towns the border in itself is sort of the the source of revenue it's the border is uh closed uh, in a way that makes it a tourist attraction or it is open in a way that it allows for trade uh, with the city on the other side of the border and so on. And I think um, this is also something that, I mean, local representation in matters deciding like actually how to build border walls or border control systems. Uh, I think that is uh, it's really important, but I think it also points to this kind of uh, democratic legitimacy deficit that might occur if uh, those things aren't taken into account uh, and that might sort of undermine the, legit the democratic legitimacy. I think, I think this example that you have in the book on, you know, how border control sort of systematically happens to citizens within their own state. They're not even trying to cross the border. Those kind of things are really, I think, detrimental to um, the, the democratic legitimacy of uh, the border in that way. Um, uh, uh, and if I can just jump in on that and just to continue it, and you know, although I don't really work on the European context in the same way as I work in the US context, um, but when I think about the internal borders of Europe, and maybe this is something that you might might speak to, Johanna, I, I tend to think that one of the, in retrospect, let's say, mistakes of the EU is that after Schengen, once borders were opened, Europe sort of just satisfied itself with the glory of openness, which is again, it's a very beautiful thing. It's very beautiful what Europe did. But what it didn't do is really invest enough infrastructure in saying now that borders are open we're going to use the borders as places and ways to stitch together the economies and infrastructural um or infrastructures of these different states and there were some there were borderland initiatives and i mean there's europe has done lots of stuff i don't mean to underplay um uh europe's foresight let's say and I know that there are cross-border university initiatives and there are, there's lots of stuff. Um, but where the borderlands themselves uh, were, uh, were tools, let's say, for ever greater union. Wasn't, uh, wasn't something I think that the Europe did enough of. And maybe that's something that if we get past Corona and if we start to reopen borders, one of the first things we should really think, really think of doing is, uh, is, or if policymakers in Europe should consider doing, is thinking about those zones, those border zones, as spaces for either democratic representation or infrastructural development, et cetera. I don't know if that speaks to your interest at all, Johanna, but I would think it would be, in a way, part of your, um, yeah, part of your subject. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, you, I, I lost you a couple of seconds there, so I'm not sure I got all of it, but I think this is a really, um, it's a very interesting question because you, there are sort of two sides of the story because another argument that you can make is that the EU very much focused on sort of opening borders and creating these border spaces uh, based on some sort of idea that you could do away with borders altogether and that, uh, one of the things that happens then is might be that there might be a counter reaction to that saying you know uh, but we are different from those people or we would speak different languages we might not have as much in common um, and it might create sort of resistance to this openness and i think this is a again a, a problem with the idea of open or closed because you can have differences across borders without uh, having closed borders. And you can have um, exchanges and like you, you were suggesting with uh, some sort of um, border zone political representation. I mean, all those things can be done, I think, uh, while sort of uh, not having to make the argument that the border is something that is bad and it has to go away. And I think maybe that was, um, that 
that, that is another sort of side of that story that the idea or the, the, the discourse then at least was much more um, focused on no more borders, uh, but we didn't really know what that would entail or um, how that could be possible. Um, I don't know if I answered your question there, but that's um, it's definitely something to, to think about. And I think this, uh, we have some questions here, so I'm trying to sort of filter and see what, what, what questions we should tackle next. Uh, we have a couple of questions about sort of the, uh, the future, so maybe we should do those. We have two questions. Uh, one that is, um, uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Will walls collapse like the Berlin Wall and a world without borders be possible again, or will the wall building fetishism of states continue? Uh, this was a very good question, I think. And we have also another question that is, um, can we build back better after the COVID pandemic or like what will be the sort of result of that? So I think maybe we should discuss a bit like what what do you think about the sort of future of of borders? What where is where are we heading, would you say? Well, let me um so I should say, and I've I've told Johanna this, but I the new book I'm actually working on uh is about the Berlin Wall and about the end of the Iron Curtain in 89. And so to go, to look forward for a moment by looking backwards, uh, I think that there's a mistake we make in assuming that there's a lot of lessons we can learn about the present walls by thinking about Berlin. And the reason for that, uh, part of it is just that different geopolitical eras have different underlying uh, tensions and interests. And so there's just always a difficulty in thinking about the present and the past as though they're co comparable, but bracket that. The function of the Berlin Wall was always about keeping East Germans in. And the function of present walls is to keep people out. And that's such a different institutional basis. And part of the reason that the Berlin Wall was effective in ways that border walls today are never effective or cannot be effective is that because what was happening in the in the GDR in East Germany was a, a comprehensive, overwhelming security state, like the, the Stasi, people's movements were so tracked internally that you could never even get to the wall, right? The idea that you would be able to cross either the Berlin Wall or the inter-German border, which is the Iron Curtain, is almost made up. It was very rare that you could even try it. And that's because every aspect of your life was clamped down on. And that story of internal overwhelming su surveillance uh, and, a and a wall designed to keep people in has almost nothing in common with the story of a wall designed to keep people out and an incredibly poor kind of surveillance we have of the rest of the world. Just to say that who comes to our borders, everything that the US and Europe, all the developed countries are trying to do is to learn more and more about people before they even get to the border. But even with the massive economies and massive amount of attention dedicated to learning about these people before they come, before in Europe's sense, they wash up upon the shores, right? Or the US case, they come to the wall in the desert. It's actually incredible how little we know about these people or even know to expect them or where they come from or anything because it's the whole world, right? And so the kinds of story we're talking about are so different that thinking about the Berlin Wall as a tool, uh, it just has less analytic purchase than I think we would think it would. And the other side of that being that this is true even with the incredible uh, sophistication of contemporary data practice, which would have been an absolute dream for the average Stasi officer right, to have the kind of data we have today. So that's, that's just a, a way into the question is I doubt that it's that helpful actually. But what I would say in terms of the future is that whereas walls have always been a little bit of a tool of symbol, right? They're symbolically powerful, but actually relatively ineffective 
certainly ineffective in the in the big sense. I mean, it's given the cost, et cetera. Uh, I think that that the rhetorical power of walls will wane, because the truth is is that populations over time will realize the walls aren't working because they don't work. And they seem sexy in the beginning and big strong men like a Donald Trump kind of person can yell about the wall and people can, can feel powerful because of it. But like any institution that you build that doesn't work, over time people will realize it's not working. And consequently, you will, it will lose its power. So instead, I think that, so I think that ultimately the, the, the urge for walling will wane. Uh, the more likely story for the future is that everything becomes more and more uh, digital and the power of data tools towards management and filtration will become overwhelming in a way that's very terrifying. We don't have enough of an idea of how to protect rights and civil liberties and et cetera against the use of data by powerful states. And when I look 10 or 20 years in the future, that's, that, that's what I would say, is that we need to be really vigilant now about how data is used um, in any kind of security, but certainly border security um, mechanism, because it's only going to get stronger and only going to get worse. And while we're yelling about walls, we're actually missing the bigger point. What about you, Johanna? What's, what are your, what's your take on this? Yeah, no, uh, I, I agree to, to, to some extent, um, and especially about this part that borders are, or border walls or physical um, sort of delimitations are ineffective in the grand scheme of things. They are very, still very destructive and violent. But I think as you're saying, the use of technology to keep people out is even more destructive, I think. And um, I, this also plays into what I said just at the beginning of, uh, you know, how, to, how much border control can we have without actually doing away with the whole point of borders as something that makes us secure. I mean, um, if we're in, infringing more and more on civil liberties and uh, rights to privacy and all those things, then um, I think we have a very big problem, as you are saying. Um, I think, I mean, what I would hope um, is I don't know. I mean, it's very hard to see how this development would turn. I mean, even if the development towards building walls comes away, uh, the development towards more uh, sophisticated technological ways of monitoring borders uh, might be very hard to do. And I think, I mean, the foundational problem here, uh, to some extent, I think, is still uh, I mean, what is it that the border is protecting? And very often it is protecting richer countries from people from poorer countries. Meaning that as long as we have this enormous economic uh, uh, global inequalities, it's very hard to see how there won't be um, ever increasing efforts to control the poorer people from moving um, than, than there is now. So I think this is a bit pessimistic, but I think it's, uh, I think economic inequalities are sort of part of the core of this problem and they cannot be solved through the institution of borders in themselves. There has to be other kinds of uh, institutional or structural changes uh, in order to deal with that. Uh, but we also had this, the second part of the question that had to do with if we have any recommendations about what we could do after the COVID pandemic is over, uh, is there sort of what can we do to not develop in this way? And I think, I mean, as you said in the, in the beginning, um, if we start using, you know, uh, antibody passports or like having uh, data on uh, those kind of things that will sort of lead uh, even fur further down this this path so I think maybe a recommendation would sort of be to uh, not uh, use these um, border controls um, in that way I mean there 
we will see I, I think i mean there there are some reasons to su suggest that you know once there is maybe a vaccine and uh, things sort of stabilize maybe um the the covid restrictions might not uh be as um, sort of prominent anymore or linger but it's very hard to tell i think i don't know would you like to say something about what you think about that yeah, I have a very pessimistic view of the way that states will continue to use data as a, as a tool of exclusion. I think the issue for me is uh, we need to have uh, not a sort of a rosy view of how states will stop using data, but rather uh, uh, as much energy and attention dedicated to protecting rights. And right now it's a very imbalanced equation where the state is putting tons of money um, and resources into these data-driven surveillance mechanisms. And there aren't nearly enough de uh, resources dedicated to rights protections to make sure that in a data universe, in a data world, uh, citizens are protected. But of course, that only solves part of the problem because there's the citizen where there's at least some kind of state interest in uh, their liberties and rights, et cetera. But there will always be the problem of migrants or those that come from the outside. More likely than a domestic problem is this will be ultimately an international problem, which is to say that then there would have to be uh, serious efforts, probably at the level of the treaty, uh, towards the protection of data um, uh, and the protection of rights of people outside of polities who are in motion. And that would require a lot of international effort um, that right now there is, yeah, there's no strong, there's no, there's no equal and opposite force, so to speak. And until that happens, yeah, it's very hard to see how rights don't get trampled on. And, you know, part of the problem to go back to the, the specifics of the border is that when we talk about something like wider borders or data borders or, or, or co-bordering, you know, there's a lot that on the surface sounds very attractive. There's a kind of prettiness to thinking about data sharing and this, this idea that we're going to control our borders together, et cetera, as if there's a kind of, you know, regionalism. I mean, like the EU, right? I mean, ultimately the EU decided to share its uh, border duties. And there is something beautiful about federations and regions. But of course, the problem is that what you end up having is states uh, working together to create an ever more perfect machine to suppress all the elements it doesn't want. In this case, just the bodies of migrants who are being violently abused and excluded. And so even just getting our minds around the cost of these kinds of state collaborative efforts and data sharing efforts um, is the beginning because until we start to understand that these ideas that we still think of or hold up as as these normative ideals um, until we understand what their costs are we're never going to have a, an open dialogue um, about what the needs are for protection it's a very good point and i think to add <laughs> add even more pessimism to this problem i i think one thing that further sort of uh, indicates that sort of uh, protection of rights and so on is something that really needs to happen but is at risk with data collection and data sharing between states is also that if we think about the legitimacy of states as you know creating eternal legitimacy between the citizens and it, its um, political leaders or organization and we think about democracy i mean uh even those kind of rights are at risk and being being sort of um, losing uh, strength globally in terms of how democracy is developing around the world and i think i mean as long as we don't have strong um uh, interest and and public um organizations and political parties uh, actively working to change politics in order to protect these kinds of rights. Uh, it's, it's a very long way ahead, at least, in order to reach this point. Um, 
And I think in relation to this, we have a, a question that I thought was really interesting. That is uh, from Linda saying, uh, what are your thoughts on the role of non-state actors for understanding borders and sovereignty? Um, and to the extent that non-governmental actors uh, shape and affect this kind of um, institutionalization of borders or certain border, border practices. Yeah, I don't have a particularly strong view of that because I think that, you know, in my own work, I'm so focused on the question of states and trying to understand uh, how uh, what states are doing that is harmful can be stoppered somehow. And, but that's not to say there aren't tons of, of ways to answer that. So for example, to go into some of the things we talked about earlier, I'm very concerned that these overlapping wide borders with these border zones uh, will end up being places that states use their doubled powers uh, to clamp down on people, migrants, et cetera. Uh, you could absolutely see that states would be unable to, especially when you did with third, third country nationals, right? So states would be unable or unwilling to really care about those people. Maybe you could persuade neighboring states to care about the other states' people. Uh, but the idea that they'd ever care about third country nationals is unfortunately unlikely. That would be where um, having some kind of NGO come in, whether it's at the international level, the local level, et cetera, and essentially be the person that watches the co-bordered area, that watches the states uh, while they're sharing their powers uh, from abusing them against migrants. I think that's a kind of domain I'd be, I would be interested in, in seeing how third party, third, sorry, non-governmental organizations would fit in. Uh, but the specifics of even what kind and in what way, with what power, with what jurisdiction, um, isn't something I have a clear answer about, except to say that I think it's, it's essential. Um, they would be essential tools. Once you identify that that's the problem, they would be part of the solvency. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, I think um, another question or another way of looking at non-state actors are to look at those uh, maybe, uh, which some re researchers are doing, looking at the companies that uh, sort of have all their um, uh, profits from building border walls and developing border technology and those kind of things. So there are, of course, um, economic sort of interests uh, that have very high stakes in developing and uh, gaining from states uh, spending a lot of money on border technology. So that is, of course, one dimension of it. But, but as you say, I think the actual managing of borders and the borders as political institutions, that's m very much in the hands of states. Uh, I think one, one thing to think about here is also that when we talk about states and state sovereignty, not all states are equal. I mean, some states will be able to use their power to affect other states in how they should do their bordering and so on. So there's also a question of political influence of states on other states. So it's uh, state actors. Uh, of course, but maybe not only in their own borders or so, and so to speak, um, that might sort of affect the way that some states are able to control their borders uh, and so on. So I think we need to start wrapping up. We only have a few minutes left. So um, Matt, do you wanna say some concluding remarks before I say my concluding remarks and give the word back to, to Sophie? Uh, no, well, I mean, thank you for this. Thank you for the invitation. And this was a, a pleasure to talk about my, I don't want to end with too much pessimism, because I think there's a kind of, um, there's always a sense that things could be worse in politics, which is a reasonable conclusion to draw. Uh, but what I think I've seen um, is not just the um, the downside of this fear about data, and this fear about COVID, because I think that COVID really is uh, uh, like any, like a lot of things that are events in politics, uh, 
they 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 matter as events, but they also matter because they give you a lens, like they crystallize certain features of the political world that might have been invisible before, and they make them visible. And I think that COVID is making visible um, certainly certain aspects of the study of borders that were, uh, yeah, maybe invisible to at least, or, 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 or invisible to most people, um, whereas certainly there were border scholars who might have thought about this stuff because they care about borders a lot. Generally speaking, I think that what COVID has done, certainly in Europe with the reclosing of borders, uh, is it's allowed people to think about borders in slightly different ways. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, if we then take that mantle and do something with it, which of course we might not, but if we were to take this new understanding um, and use it in a way towards progressive change, that's a great thing. And the other thing I would say is that I think that one of the positive, as, as hard as it is to say that out loud without laughing, positive aspects of the uh, Trump administ administration and Brexit uh, is that there is also now, whereas those represented a pushback against certain kinds of globalism or think ways of thinking about openness, there's now a pushback against the pushback. And I think that with each, certainly in the example of Trump, uh, with each use of the wall politically, its rhetorical power wanes. And it's not just about the US-Mexico wall, it's frankly, all idioms of walling. And the example that comes to my mind now uh, is, you know, I remember when after his great success in making the wall a political issue in 2016, the first big thing that Trump did on the political stage internationally uh, was his summit with the, uh, the North Korean leader uh, on the border with this, like, this famous handshake on the border. The border is a site uh, where the site of the of the wall and the DMZ was there a the example of the bridge the thing that it was being bridged by their handshake as opposed to him doing his photo op at the wall in you know Arizona and Texas etc where the wall was this metaphor of of exclusion and both over time have lost some of their saliency and i think the fact that a card played over and over again gets weaker each time uh, is meaning that now people are more aware of the symbolic power of walling and its cost. And frankly, in 2018, in the midterm elections, it didn't work as well as he'd hoped. Uh, famously, he said there was this caravan of migrants that were going to come and destroy America or something, and it didn't work. And it's actually not working again in this election. And so there is a little bit of hope that some of these institutions that we dislike and distrust uh, are actually losing their symbolic power. So, okay, that's it. That's my spiel. Thank you. Uh, Johanna, last word's yours. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to end, I think, with an example and also a bit of optimism because I'm, when it comes to politics, I'm still sort of always an optimism in terms of politics is something that people make, which means that it can change. Uh, so borders are also something that are, uh, it's made by states, but states are also made up of people. And um, I think, I mean, when I did my PhD, I studied the introduction of visa freedom at the border between Norway and Russia, a border that previously had been extremely closed. It was also one of the largest economic differences across the border in the world. Uh, at that border and still um, the border kept opening up and more and more travels were happening across the border and so on. So I think um, borders are not something constant. So even if walls seem very sort of permanent in a sense, they aren't. And I think um, political movements can arise that change them. And as you say, they can lose their sort of appeal um, so I think if I want to sort of summarize uh, something that we've talked about today, I think it's also the importance of not getting stuck in this borders are either open or closed dichotomy, but actually ask the questions of who is the border for, 
what are the different ways in which a border can be open or closed or for whom can it be open and closed and what can we do to sort of um, alleviate the negative aspects of borders and I think thinking of borders as institutions enable us to do just this which I think is good so I think I'll stop there and uh, leave the word back to Sophie Perfect. Thank you both so much, Johanna and Matthew, for this inspiring discussion. And thank you all in the audience so much for tuning in and asking interesting questions. You can download Johanna's paper for free at ui.se and Matthew's book is available in stores now. Have a good evening. I hope to see you in another UI webinar soon. Take care and goodbye.